All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, we are talking about drip irrigation, and my name is Heather Bass. I'm a conservation specialist with Tarrant Regional Water District. Um, if you have any questions throughout, you can type them into the little question and answer box there, and our speaker will get to them at the end of the program. This presentation is um, provided to you by Tarrant Regional Water District. So before we get started and I introduce our speaker and everything, um, we're going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about TRWD. So TRWD is um, our local raw water supplier. And what that means is Tarrant Regional Water District um, maintains all of the pipelines and four area lakes that are all necessary to pump um, raw surface water to our local water treatment plants. And then our uh, water treatment plants treat that water to drinking water standards and then they provide it to our communities. And um, Tarrant Regional Water District also um, supports uh, our customer cities, and those are like Fort Worth, Mansfield, Arlington, and um, all the other cities in Tarrant County there. And um, we also provide um, some of this educational programming for you, and that is because conservation is an important water supply strategy to meet the needs of our growing population. And so our water conservation uh, facing website is SaveTarrantWater.com and you can go there to look at all of our resources. And um, a few things that you can do, you can sign up for free weekly watering advice where once per uh, week on Monday, you'll get um, advice that is specific to your location that tells you approximately how much you should water your lawn based on uh, the weather and how much it's rained and everything. And then you can also, if you're a Tarrant County resident, you can sign up for a free sprinkler check where a licensed irrigator will come to your house and they'll check out your sprinkler, let you know if you need any type of maintenance, let you know how much water you're using, that type of thing. We also have a calendar of events and classes just like this one. Um, and then we've got tons of like water saving tips, videos of previous events like this one. Um, and then what we also do um, is we partner with other organizations to provide these water conservation and gardening kind of education programs for the public and so some of those organizations are like the um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the Tarrant County Master Gardeners. And so now that I've told you a little bit about um, TRWD again my name is Heather Bass and I am a conservation specialist at TRWD and I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker now for drip irrigation. It is Dr. Dottie Woodson, and she is an irrigation expert. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her and let her begin her presentation. Thank you, Heather. Okay, right. so we're going. Wait a minute. Yeah. So. Yeah, I gave you permission, I think, to share your screen. Okay. So we're going to talk about drip irrigation today. And. The main reason we're talking about drip irrigation, um, as you can see, drip irrigation puts water out very, very slowly. And why is this so important to us? Because we have clay soil, the infiltrate of water, rainwater, irrigation water, into our clay soils very, 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 very slow. And so when we look at drip irrigation, the research shows it's 90% efficient compared to spray irrigation and sometimes rotor irrigation that can be as little as 35% efficient and all the way up if it's really, really designed and maintained properly up to 70%. So you can see there's a huge opportunity for water savings, but I'm gonna plug Ter Regional Water District's free irrigation checkup right here too, because if you do have an irrigation system and you're looking at your water bill and you think it's way too high, please call them or email them and sign up for that free irrigation checkup they require that you be there when the irrigator comes by to do the checkup and you'll learn so much from that irrigator. You'll be glad you signed up for it. And you'll be glad you're there. He will also help you set your controller if the irrigating, irrigation schedule is not good for the type of plants that you have planted and the type of soil that you have planted. 
Uh, the other thing about drip irrigation, it applies water slowly under pressure. And so that, like I said, is very important because of the infiltration rate. The supplies for you to do it yourself are readily available and easy for you to install. And I hope I'm gonna show you some helpful hints about how you can do that. And so encourage you or empower you to do that if you would like. Um, you don't have to do your whole entire irrigation system. You could do, you know, the foundation planting around your house if that's, you know, a zone. You can do a ground cover bed, you can do a shrub bed, you can do a flower bed. You know, we'll talk about all the different ways that people use drip irrigation system. Also, drip irrigation system may be, you know, it, it, exempt from water restrictions during drought, and that's mainly around your trees and around your foundation. Your trees are your most valuable part of your foundation, of your landscape, but the foundation planting around your house is also valuable because of our shrinking and swelling soils. And so it's very important not to lose trees in times of drought, like they haven't declared us in a drought, but we're in a drought, you know, but, um, Reduces water loss due to evaporation since you're applying the water below mulch or below the soil even because they're subsurface ir drip irrigation lines. And then reduces water loss and contamination due to irrigation runoff. Now, I'm not saying runoff is not possible with drip irrigation because I've seen it in parking lot islands, but um, it does reduce a lot of that runoff. And runoff, of course, you're paying for that water that's running down the storm drain, even though it's not benefiting your landscape. So we wanna avoid that anytime we can. Reduces leaching of water and nutrients below the root zone. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's very, very easy to determine the depth, the time, runtime, and the depth that that water will go. And we'll talk about how to do that with a screwdriver. And then of course, we're gonna talk about saving money and saving Saving water saves money. So what are the benefits? One of them is that you can match the water um, precipitation rate or water application rate to the plant water needs. In other words, this bed is very, very, very narrow. Um, it's on to a patio that has a wonderful wall there in its stucco. If we put spray irrigation on that stucco wall, that's not gonna last any time at all. If we get spray irrigation out into that wonderful walkway, you know, it's gonna start chipping and away at, at the, you know, surface of the concrete. So there's many, many areas that we need to think about only using drip irrigation. In the parkways of your landscape where your street is on one side, you have a small, you know, 35 to 64 inch parkway between your street and your sidewalk. That's another area that's very, very, very difficult to water the spray irrigation. And if you do, um, you know, there's a chance of runoff more so there than anywhere else because the soil gets very, very, very hard right there. People walk on it, you know, people park in front of your house and, you know, get out of their car on it. It gets very, very hot from the, the, the road. And so that's a very, very hard part to do. And then we also want to match that application rate inches per hour uh, to the soil's infiltration rate, which is again measured in inches per hour. I'll show you a chart so that you can see how slow that is on clay soil. Apply water directly to the root zone. This reduces overspray into your sidewalks, onto your fence, onto your retaining wall, things like that, and evaporation, because I don't know how good, you know, your irrigation system is about your coverage, about you've got the runtime right, you've got the days of the week right, everything right, but it's still putting water up into the air. And so the wind blows and you get it displaced, the wind blows and you get evaporation on a day like today, there'll be so much evaporation, not of just water you might be irrigating with, but water out of your soil. Just amazing as the heat builds like this. Now the humidity is gonna be high, so that reduces more than if it was hot like this and dry. And then properly designed and installed drip irrigation can be 90% 90, 90 efficient. 
Now, TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, is the, I don't want to say ruler of <laughs> irrigation, but they're the ones who oversee a lot of our, bio, our environmental issues, and they pass a lot of ordinances, pass those on to the cities to enforce, and one of their charges is irrigation. So they actually you know, see that irrigators are trained, see that irrigators get their CEUs every year. They have to pass an exam. And if they let their member, you know, their um, license lapse, they have to retake that exam. They have to take 40 hours of training just to make them eligible to take the exam. So it's, you know, it's not quite as much as electrician or a plumber, all the hoops that they have to go through to get their license. But a licensed irrigator is an educated irrigator. Now, they're not going to know every single thing. I don't know every single thing. And one of the things I'm proud to say is the irrigation industry is always working on new and better ways to save water. Just like Parent Regional Water District wants us to save water, you want to save water so your water bill's not high. The manufacturers of drip irrigation and all irrigation supplies want to save water. So the one rule that I want you to see, this top rule, is all new irrigation systems require that parkway or any narrow strip of landscaping less than 36 inches and on have um, impervious surfaces on two or three sides that all new systems not your existing system but your new systems need to be in drip irrigation so these new houses are being built new schools are being built new buildings businesses all of these are being built you have to remember that this rule is being um, enforced because all irrigation systems have to get a permit and to get that permit you have to put in your plan and design and so that is very highly enforced that includes all islands most mediums you know everything in your parkway in front of your house then the other one i want you to be aware of is the irrigation system should be designed to have separate zones to match the plant water requirement and microclimate factors like this fence is shading this area, this house is shading this area. This is on the north side of the house. It'll never get any direct sunlight. You know, so the landscaper is designing your landscaper with all these microclimate ideas in mind. The topographic features like the slope, the soil conditions like clay and the hydraulic requirements. And so you have to realize the irrigator and the landscaper try to work together. Hopefully you are hiring the same company and the irrigator and landscape designer would be in that same company, work very closely together. Now, the other one is, is not to spray water over impervious surfaces of concrete, asphalt, wood, stone, um, set with mortar, walls, fences, and sidewalks and streets. I can, I, can, I can show you pictures of how fences are being totally destroyed much, much quicker than they should be being destroyed by old age. They're being destroyed because spray irrigation is constantly sweeping across them. Some of you have probably witnessed this where there's you know, a crescent shape white against a wall or against a fence. And that's the calcium in our water, whereas the calcium is good for us to drink, but it's not most certainly not good for your infrastructure. And the constant application of water on these hardscapes, these impervious surface, will eventually damage them. Homeowners Association, many of us have them and really embrace them and they do a lot of good things for all the homeowners in the association. And so one of the things that I need for everyone to understand, there was a bill passed, um, Senate Bill 19, 19, 198, back in uh, 2013 saying that implementing measures to of solid waste composting should not be disallowed. Installing rain barrels, rainwater collection should, should not be disallowed. Implementing, this is the one I want you to be aware of, implementing efficient irrigation, including underground drip and other drip systems. 
And then the last one, of course, is using drought resistant landscape and water conserving natural or water conserving natural turf grasses. And so we have had many, many fights um, over the years before this law was passed with homeowners association that wanted everyone's landscape to look exactly alike and have all the same type of plants and, you know, have some uniformity to the landscaping. And whereas that might look really, really good, a lot of the turf grasses and the landscape plants they had chosen for this were high water use plants. And so this bill is very, very important. And I know a lot of neighborhood associations, once this bill was passed, changed a lot of their landscaping rules for their residents so they could be in compliance with this. So when we talk about drip irrigation, we have to talk about three different ways that we're gonna look at this. One is to design and install for a new landscape. You don't even have have an irrigation system. So right then and there, you have the choice to tell your landscape designer, the irrigator, that you want all your irrigation and drip irrigation, or of course the parkway has to go into drip irrigation. But you can most certainly choose to do that around your foundation um, planting. You know, the foundation planting we always think of, it hides your foundation, your slab foundation. But the other thing we look at it is if you irrigate it, you keep the soil moisture even and you don't have your foundation, you know, slipping when it dry, gets too dry or when it gets too wet, but you don't have that shifting of the soil. Then convert an existing irrigation system. Now, I don't know how many already have an irrigation system. Many of you might already have a landscape that you want to add a drip irrigation system to. So we're going to talk about all these different ways. And then the last one, of course, is to attach a drip irrigation system to your garden faucet. That is real convenient for people who, you know, just want to do the foundation planning or they have a lot of containers on their patio or deck and they want to put a drip irrigation to water those containers. So it's very, very convenient. And so this is one of the ways we're going to talk about that, removing your nozzle and your spray nozzles using one of your heads in order to do that conversion. This is how we attach it to a spigot. And we're going to talk about all the components here and show those to you. Now for the buy-in, this is what I want. So if you look at this top chart and it says percent slope. I hope none of you have a slope over 4%, but many of you might, you know, in one area in the backyard, the front yard and, and like that. So we have to look at that. Our parent material, our soil is clay. It's a very, very hard clay, shrinking and swelling clay. Parent materials, montemurrillite and kelonite. And so we have to look at this first, you know, box right here and on a zero to 4% slope, the infiltration rate of water going into the soil is 0.13 to 0.44. And I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, and all the irrigation systems I have audited have a precipitation rate of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and even one inch. And this is measured inches per hour. And so if we can't match that infiltration rate, with the precipitation rate, what happens? That's when we get runoff. Now, the larger the slope, the less the infiltration, the taller the slope. The, and so we have to look at that also. And unfortunately, uh, slope of above 8% or above 12%, that's really, really difficult. And that may be when you start talking about terracing the slope or putting in a retaining wall, making two, you know, two levels, things like that. And that would be discussed with your landscaper and the irrigators. Now, everyone's always asking, where's drip irrigation used? Well, I want you to know that drip irrigation has been around for more than two decades. If you've ever been visited a greenhouse, you've probably seen a drip irrigation in the greenhouse, watering all the plants in the containers. If you have been to a vineyard, if you look real closely on the line, the bottom wire where they are, you know, condoring their 
grapevines, there is a drip irrigation tube. They're dropping the water. It's called a point source drip irrigation tube, dropping the water right there at the base of where the grapevine is growing up onto the wire. It's very, very, very specific because they only want the water there. They don't want the water going out into the other areas to discourage weeds. Orchards, orchards have used drip irrigation for many, many years. And, you know, some vineyards don't need a lot of water, don't require a lot of water. Some orchards don't require a lot of water. But in order to get a good, good, good crop, you know, they're going to use drip irrigation, and of course, in greenhouses. So I have one in my rose garden. I have point source irrigation in my rose garden where I have a, you know, half inch tube that you buy in the drip irrigation tip has no holes in it. And when I put that at the base of each of my roses, I put drippers right there at the base of each of my roses. So the water is being applied under the rose bush in the shade of the rose bush during the summer. Great, great, great way. Perennial gardens, shrub areas, vegetable gardens, ground cover areas, foundation watering parkways, parking lot islands. And then way, way, way down at the bottom, notice I put lawns because they now have a very, very reliable subsurface drip irrigation that you can put in a lawn area. So think about this in a minute. Look at this beautiful planting right here. You know, I mean, who did not want that in their yard? These are plants that will be there all summer, all summer, because you've got lantana that blooms all summer. You've got the grass with the beautiful seed heads on it. Now the Sweet potato vine, of course, is considered an annual in this area. It freezes down, sometimes comes back, but not always. And so we usually replant it. This is a chartreuse color that sets off all those other colors. You can see the solid green background of the foundation planting. Now this yard has many, 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 many different beds. And it would be very, very easy to put a spray irrigation in each of these beds, have them on different zones, you know, on the irrigation controller. So each of them can be watered differently because you can see this ground cover bed up front has trees shading it most of the time. It's on the east side of the house, so it doesn't get any sun after 11 o'clock. Then you can see some of the foundation planting there on the front porch and then on the corner there uh, with the neighbor's driveway. And so each of these would require a little bit different run time. And so if you put them all on the same zone, you know, you might be doing a disservice. Of course, adding a mulch to all these planted bed helps, helps a great deal too. Now you can see the one behind the sidewalk there before the retaining wall, you can see a real nice turf area. It looks really, really, really good. But look up here in the foreground, past the ground cover bed, the turf grass that is closer to the house. It's shaded by that tree in the morning, it's shaded by the house all the rest of the day when the sun gets over the house and, and back of the house. And so it's not doing as well. There's a slight slope there, so any storm water also accumulates right there. And so it's not doing as well. And so if those two lawn areas are on the same zone, you know, they're not going to do the, well because they don't need to be. One's in the shade and one's in the sun. How about this for a flower bed? Who wants this in their landscape? This is a seasonal bed. And so this landscape company will change that out. They have a summer planning they put in and they have a winter planning that they put in. So there's always, always color under these crepe myrtles. And the crepe myrtles shade the bed a little bit, but nothing like the oak trees in the uh, picture before. So the other thing I need to explain to you is a different type of drip irrigation tubing. So we have what are called drip line, drip line. And a drip line is the emitter is inside the tubing right here and allows the water to be put out at the rate that you select the drip line for. So we have 0.5, we have 0.6, this is gallons per hour. We have 0.9, we have one gallon per hour. This is half inch tubing and this is the most common tubing used in landscapes. This is actually quarter inch drip tubing. 
And if you look real closely, you can see the little holes with the emitters on the inside of the tubing. This is going to put water out very, very, very slowly. And we use this in different ways. I've started using this in the vegetable gardens and all the schools and community gardens I help with because uh, particularly in the schools, this half inch one seems to get uh, nicked by the kids with their, their shovels and hose. And so this sort of rolls away from it. These are pictures of brown, you know, different, you know, um, brands here. But I want you to know that, that it also comes in black, purple, and green. Purple denoting non-potable water. Um, so all the tubing is that way, or black, or black. Now this is point source drip irrigation, and point source drip irrigation is where you're going to put tubing without any holes in it, black, brown, purple, green, out into your landscape, and then you're going to punch a hole right here and put that emitter in exactly where you want it to go. So can you see my brown tubing here? And so I have a hole punch right here. Um, and so what I can do with this hole punch, see how the hole punch works? Okay, so what I can do is put that hole punch right here where I want my dripper to go. You see that? Did you hear that click? Did you hear that or pop rather? And so this works real well to put those holes in it. And then as far as that is concerned, the drippers are available in many, many different types of uh, emitters. So we can put it out like in my rose garden. It, I can't find my emitter. I put her on the table to show you at five gallons per hour, or we can put it in, um, in oh, on it. Um, it just pops right in and you get the emitter right here in this hole. You get the emitter that you want to put out. So in my, like where my lambs there is, I have a dripper, an emitter, a dripper that puts water out at 0.5 gallons an hour. In my rose garden, I will put the dripper in here that puts it out at a gal uh, five gallons an hour. Big difference between 0.5 and, um, you know, five gallons an hour. So it depends on the plant water requirement. The neat thing about point source strip irrigation is you can put the different emitters in the line. Whereas the inline, the drip line, it's all the same. It'll all be 0.5 or 0.6 or 0.9 uh, gallons an hour. So I want you to be able to be aware that there's that. And I think I have a, a picture I can show you in a minute um, where we have applied that. This is called micro irrigation. And a lot of people like to see the uh, tubing up and above so they can see the water going. And, you know, that's pretty important that you understand micro irrigation. And so when you buy the micro tubing, it's a quarter inch. And this one is like this top one right here. It has the emitter. See this big thick part right here? You see the hole right there? And I think they're every 12 inches and you can get it every six inches. But I can also buy tubing, the quarter inch tubing, with absolutely no holes in it, just like I can buy the half inch. And that's where I can do things like this. Here's my little demonstration for you to see if I can get it untangled right here. And so I might want to do something like this. Okay, I'm getting it untangled. I'm sorry. I thought I had it all set up so I could grab it. Okay, so I might do something like this. I might take a tubing, black, brown, green, whatever, purple, you know, and put it along my patio, along my deck, and I might then put a micro tubing. This is a tubing, quarter inch tubing and no holes in it. And then at the end, I would put my dripper. And here's my dripper right here. And this dripper you can buy on a stake. You can buy the drippers not on stakes also, but this one is. I use this a lot in my greenhouse because this is adjustable. I can open it up and get a bigger, you know, spray area, or I can tighten it down and get absolutely no water come out of it.
And so this is a big possibility. You can hook this to your faucet if you want. We'll show that later. Or I have a lot of long, long, big containers. And you see what I've done here? I've put in, you know, my, you know, cu uh, coupling right here. And so I've got my tubing, the length that needs to go from the bottom of my deck to my container. And then I've made the circle with the drip line. See, there's a dripper, there's a dripper, and here's a dripper, and here's a dripper. So there would be four drippers in my large container. I don't make it the size of the container, because if you put it, put it too close to the edge, it just goes down the edge of the pot and the soil. So this needs to be sort of in the middle. And you can make these large or small. This is a T. The micro tubing has T's. The quarter inch tubing has T's and elbows. All kinds of fittings that we want to look at um, to use to do these type of things. So it's very versatile. There's no one way to do it. There's no one place to put it. Many different brands out there. The major brands are Netafem, Rainbird, Toro, and Landscape, which is put out by Ewing Irrigation, which is one of the irrigation supplies in our area. We also have other irrigation supply houses. Uh, Metro Irrigation is here in Fort Worth. And I believe um, you have several in, uh, Metro Irrigation on Cooper and Arlington, but Ewing Irrigation has five or six locations in Tarrant County. So um, we can buy our supplies there or we can buy our supplies at Lowe's and Home Depot. Lowe's and Home Depot has a wonderful, wonderful irrigation area, past the plumbing area, ask for it if you can't find it. And all of the supplies I'm talking about here and all of the supplies to update or you know fix up your irrigation system are right there. Good, good signage, very good explanation. And a lot of times they hire retired plumbers and retired irrigators to, you know, help people in those aisles. Sometimes they'll have workshops. So uh, please look at that. So you can see right here, you know, I've got T's right here, you know, leading. I have a circle around the planted area with this. And then I'm going across to the other side of the circle. I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. Look at this odd shape bed right here. And so it very, very much leads to different shapes, circles, squares, ovals, triangles, very, very much by all the different fittings you can use. This is a T, you know, and when we talk about the brand and the size, quarter inch, half inch of the drip irrigation, we need to make sure we get the fittings that are for that tubing. Um, then the other thing, this is a Master Gardener project in Kaufman County, and I mathematically figured out how much tubing they need from their landscape design of their demonstration garden by their courthouse, and I said it's going to be about 500 feet. And I want you to know they bought a 500-foot row of tubing. Now, when you cut these straps that are holding this together, it's like slinky gone wild. You know, it just wants to pop out there and go everywhere, you know. So we literally rolled the links of the tubing out that we wanted. When we did the drip irrigation on the native landscape over at the Hewland Library, I want you to know we needed about 500 feet. And I remembered to tell those master gardeners, please, please, please buy 500 foot rows. Don't buy a 500 foot row. This is usually bought by commercial landscapers. They love these, but they have a caddy that they can put it on, cut the straps, it locks it down, and then they can pull out the links they need. That doesn't take two people doing it. One of the things I always tell everyone is when you get your ready to do this, take the straps off your 100 foot roll and roll it out the whole 100 foot length on a nice hot sunny day and it gets all that kinkiness and um, slinkiness out of it if you lay it out straight and much much easier to handle for that reason. Now the emitter like I said is on the inside. It's a little plated system and the reason for that plated system is if you get any trash in your line, if you don't, you know, calcium buildup, you know, all of that kind of stuff, it's very, very easy to filter that out and capture that so the little tiny hole the water comes out doesn't get stopped up. 
So like I said, you can get half inch and quarter inch. The emitters are 12 inches apart, 18, 24, 26, and you could order them even wider than that if you have a very specific crop that, that you're growing. Many different manufacturers, they all have tutorials on their websites, and I'll bring that up you know, um, so that you can see those. They apply water, I think I've said this before, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, and one inch a gallon, depending on what you buy. So you're going to buy the tubing by the distance the emitters are apart and buy what that hole will put out per gallon to meet the needs of the watering you need to do. One of the other supplies you need to maybe look at is a tubing cutter. This is a tubing cutter and it's real, real easy to put your tubing in here, measure exactly what you need, and this just snaps right down and cuts off the pieces that you need, much better than some of the other tools you might have handy because you want this really, really nice, clean cut right here so that your, your, your fittings will fit right in there real smoothly. Okay, now the fittings must be designed, I mean, the tubing is not designed for certain fitting. So when you buy your tubing, I don't care what brand you buy, you're going to want to buy the fitting specifically designed for that. And so you can see I've got crosses, I've got T's, I've got elbows, I've got um, couplings, I've got couplings. Now these might not ever need a cross. I use those a lot in boxes that we're doing for community gardens and for um, school garden. Uh, but T's are essential. The, if you're not going to be able to loop your, I'll show you a picture of how to, you can loop it. You know, this might be very important for you. I know it is on the boxes at school gardens and community gardens. And then couplings. Couplings is a fitting that puts two pieces of pipe together. And I'll tell you, you know, after you measure and figure out the measurement of how many you want, and it says 200 feet or less, you know, but more than 100, you're going to need couplings to put that tubing together. The other thing about couplings is this becomes your repair part. And so we want extra of these instead of buying six that you figure you need, you might want to buy 10. A lot of the irrigation places uh, like Ewing and Metro, they sell them in bags of, of, of 20. You know, keep all the extras, don't throw them out because you will eventually uh, use them all. There are some fittings that go on the outside of the tubing instead of the inside of the tubing. I think this is by a corporation called DIG and they sell um, equipment at Home Depot. And I think Lowe's has rainbow, all kinds of fitting. So the main thing about fittings is please, please, please get them that match, that match your tubing that you're buying. Um, buy a, a, a cutter. These are the hole punches, the single one. I like the plier one. I do this a lot. I help community gardens, master gardeners, and um, school gardens a lot. You know, so I, I, I like that hole punch one, but if I'm going to be doing a lot, I, I want the plier kind. And I think it's $2 versus $5 and it's worth it. Okay, now here's a, a part we're going to show. Um, it comes in um, three quarter and, oh, and half inch. Um, this might be used, I'm going to show you a picture later, um, to start a, an irrigation, drip irrigation from an existing system. So we show those being used in a little while. Um, these, uh, this is a, um, what we call a cap that you can put on the end of your drip irrigation tubing and that cap actually comes off so you can wash it out. And so if you think you've gotten a lot of debris because most of us put the tubing under mulch so that the, you know, raccoon down the street's not gonna come and drink water out of it, bite into it, that type of thing. And so we need to do that. And this is a this is a crimper, and it does the same thing. You can actually bend the tubing and put that on there. These are some of the. This is a stick emitter I showed you earlier, and these are other types of nos not nozzles, but drip irrigation emitters is what they call them. These are the the drippers drippers, 
And of course, again, you have to not understand how much water you want to put out. So here's an example in one of our community gardens. You can see that we have the drip line and what you can, are seeing is the wetting pattern of the drip line. Here it's coming up from the garden, you know, the main line of the garden. And, you know, we're going to turn this on either manually or with a timer. And then over here, we've got a elbow and we've got a T, we've got an elbow, we've got a T, a T, and a T, and an elbow. And so this is something that we can do. And then in most vegetable gardens, straw or leaves or bark mulch is used to mulch it. And I like the, the hay, the straw, not hay. Straw, it's a byproduct of the grain industry. After they've gotten the grain, they bale up the straw the, that held the shafts, that held the, the grain. There's not as much weed seed in it is why I like it. The light color reflects light out away from the soil, which is a huge, huge benefit. Now here I've used a combination of the half inch tubing with no holes in it and the quarter inch tubing. And this is going down each of the different um, beds where the, in this case, green beans are growing. And you can see what I've done here is put in the no hose, no, no hose on this, but I've put a little shut off valve. It's like a gate valve that you can put perpendicular, closes the water off, or you can put it straight line and it lets the water out into the part of the tubing that's going to drip the water out. This works very, very efficiently. I'm embarrassed that there's no straw there or no uh, mulch there, but uh, obviously way into the season and it's all been, been composted. So the quarter inch, half inch, you have to remember. Now this is attached to a garden hose. Someone sent me this picture, one of the um, irrigation houses that sell drip irrigation tubing. But I, I just wanted mainly for you to see this fitting. I use this a lot on rain barrels to put out the quarter inch tubing or into wildlife guzzlers. But all spigots, all outdoor spigots are required to have a backflow prevention device and this does not have one. So that's why I hate to show it short of, but that would be manually done. You can put a timer there, false a timer there and, and do a timer. So. Here's what we want to look at. Do it yourself or hire a licensed irrigator. Now, I've had people take my class before and they were like, man, I am so excited. I'm going to go home and do this really, really, really quick. And then, you know, weeks later, I had this one lady call me back and said, well, you know, I've decided I just can't do this. You know, I'm 82 years old and I'm going, Oh, okay, okay. Well, then you need to hire a licensed irrigator. She said she called three different irrigators and none of them did drip irrigation. And so she had to call a couple more and we had a couple of recommendations we could make for, for people who did do drip irrigation. She was such a happy camper when it does. Now, price break. Price break, your labor or the licensed irrigator labor? Now you have to remember a licensed irrigator to do all they have to do. Take a 40 hour course, which costs five to $600. Take an exam, which costs $250. CEUs eight a year, which usually cost about $100 each. And all the insurance that they have to carry, all the liability that they have to carry, not just on their work, but also workers comp, you know, they have to pay uh, insurance, health insurance themselves, you know, and so there's in truck insurance, they have to have cell phones to talk to their customers. It's a very expensive job, just like it is to be an electrician or a plumber. So a, a irrigation licensed irrigator will charge anywhere from a hundred to $120 an hour. Okay. So do it yourself. Now, what is your time worth? Now that lady, it wasn't necessarily the money situation, but it was her age situation. She didn't think she could get down on her knees, put the tubing together, pin them down to the ground, you know, all that labor that, that she would have to do herself. And so to her, it was well worthwhile 
doing the environmentally correct thing and doing the water saving thing by putting having a licensed irrigator put hers in. Now, they design or they can convert an existing system, install it, and then also they can repair it. Now, you yourself, you yourself, can, or you got a new, you don't have an irrigation system, this is going to be all you got? Or are you going to convert an existing system? Are you going to cut, attach it to a faucet? Or in some cases, I've had people want to put the drip irrigation system out in the back backyard, way away from their garden spigot, their faucet, but they are one from the vegetable garden or herb garden way back there. And so you can actually put in a drip irrigation with a garden hose attachment there at that spot and then bring your garden hose out to it. And of course, with a timer, filter, all the things required to do drip irrigation. Remember, it works low under pressure. Most of our main lines going through our existing irrigation system will have 60 PSI. And then in the lateral lines where your irrigation head um, pops up, you're going to have 30 PSI. And a lot of those, you know, that might be too high for what you want to do. I'm going to show you a chart and it depends on how much inches or feet of tubing you're going to use to the pressure you're going to want. You might want more than 30 PSI. And so if you're going long, 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 long distances. I have pictures here of the different types of pressure regulators. You can see this one says pressure regulator, 20 PSI, three uh, quarter inches, 25 to 15 gallons per minute. Water flows this way, nice arrow to show you that. And so three quarter inch means the fittings that put this in need to be three quarter inch. And then the one down here is actually a drip irrigation pressure regulator if you were going to put it in your garden uh, spigot. And so you can see my spigots here, my backflow preventer. I've got a splitter so it doesn't tie it up. Well, I thought it was all screwed together well. Um, our filter, in this case, I have a faucet timer manual. Um, you, you turn it on and it just goes click, 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 and it turns the water off. Uh, this is the pressure regulator in that picture right there. All of these fittings that I have right here are garden threads for garden fittings. And you have to understand, we also have what are called pipe threaded. All of this equipment comes with pipe threading. They don't match. Pipe threading doesn't go with garden hose threadings. So you have to look. And if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, I'm going to tell you right now, they're not necessarily in the box I say they are. The, the, the filters, the pressure regulators are all side by side by side. And sometimes you pick up what you think you're getting, a faucet one, and it turns out to be pipe threading. Pipe threading is a very tight screw, and garden hose threading is a wider screw. So please, please, please make sure you got the right thing. Okay, now, drip line. You know, this is how much lateral length that you can do with 12-inch spacing, 18-inch, and 24. These are the most common. If I have the 15 PSI, and I can do the 0.6 gallons per hour, I can go 255 feet. If I have the 0.9, I can go 940, uh, 94. And so same with all the others, the 18 inch spacing, you can see we can go a little bit longer, the 24 inch spacing, of course, we can go a little bit longer. If we need to go long, 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 you know, we want 50 PSIs. Your main line will have 60 PSI, so that's a possibility that you can do that. And you can see, of course, how long you can go with all of these different size tubing. Very important when you sit down with paper or go out in your landscape with a yardstick or a tape, yard tape, a measuring tape to, to figure all this out. Now, you can install a new installation or convert uh, in a valve box to convert a system, 
this is one of the things you need to look at is what is required to do drip irrigation. So you can get a nice square box, you know, to put all this in, have it underground, out of the way. I've put a shutoff valve in the picture, but you know, a lot of people know that these gate valves, ball valves, you know how to open and close those, open when it's parallel with the line, close when it's perpendicular. And then a valve. This is an irrigation valve with wires on it and a solenoid that you can hook to an irrigation timer. Of course, you can use um, battery powered timers also um, in, in your box. But the reason why you don't always have to put a shutoff valve is because most of your valves, irrigation valves, if you look right here, you see this big handle on here? If I turn it this way, it's on, which is what we usually have them when they're in our valve box. But if I turn it perpendicular, it's just like that gate valve. It's just like the gate valve. And so I've turned it off. And so you don't necessarily have to have that ball or, or, or gate valve there. This is the irrigation filter. It's very important for you to understand that the manufacturer of the tubing um, recommends a filter. And inside here, there are different priorities of the filter. This is a 200 um, point filter. You can see this fine mesh screen on here, and it's going to filter everything out. Of course, if we're using city water, you know, there's not a trash in that line, but it will filter out uh, some of the calcium. And so that's very important. The one on my faucet one right here. Um, I don't think it's quite, quite, I think it's 150 or 100. You get 100, 150, uh, 200. And so you can see this is just a nylon filter right here. It seats down in here really good. And every now and then you should look at these and, and maybe clean them out. Now this was on my uh, rainwater harvesting thing. And so the filter looks pretty, pretty, um, trash, so to speak. But anyway, we've got to understand about the threading. Also, I'm going to introduce this part right here to you. This is a cap on the filter. Sometimes if we're putting this on faucets, we might in the winter might, might disconnect it from the faucet or wrap it against the faucet. Um, we haven't had really cold winters like that, but a lot of people still do it. But uh, to drain it, if you release it from the faucet, it will drain, all the water will drain out of the tubing, the filter, everything. But you can also take this off and this allows air into the system and that air forces the water out of, of the drip system. <clears throat> then new system. In irrigation systems, we have what is called a main line. The main line is teed off of the line that goes into your house to provide you with the safest drinking water in the world at the amount that you want at the pressure, you know, that is significant for all your appliances and faucets, showers, tubs in your house. And so what we might want to do is design a system with a main line and then off of this main line is where we put our zone. And when we put our zones, we put our zones. Remember the rule at the beginning? We put our zones off of a valve, and then it's called lateral lines when we do that. Lateral lines come off of this valve and into the area that you want to be that zone. And that runtime can be different from all the other runtimes. Now, one of the things that I have to explain to you is if you're going to do this yourself, you have to obey all the irrigation rules that a licensed irrigator would. So you have to put something on paper. You have to put in a backflow prevention device or hire a backflow prevention person to put that in for you off of your home water, the pipe that goes into your home water. And it's probably best to do that because we're talking about cutting pipe. Cutting pipe that carries water 
into your house. And so that part should be done by a licensed irrigator or a backflow um, uh, uh, installer and inspector. Okay, then in the lateral line, once you've decided where your lateral line should be, then you're going to put in your start of your irrigation system. And that's where I was showing you these two pieces here, where I can come up with a half inch or a quarter inch um, start in my in my PVC pipe. These are, you know, pipe threading that makes it real easy to do that. And so the wires in here are the wires that go in the trench with the main line and ladder line from the valve, the irrigation valve, to your irrigation controller. And you will use the same irrigation controller as you would for a regular sprinkler system. And so that's in a way why it's easy to convert an existing irrigation system. Now, the labor of doing this trenching and all that might not be something you want to do. So you might get the ear license irrigator to do the PVC part, have your fitting come above your soil, and then you do the drip irrigation part. That's another option. The drip irrigation part is time consuming, you know, compared to just putting a sprinkler head right there um, <laughs> every couple of, every couple of five or six or 10 feet. So this is what it would look at after I dig the trench in and you can see I've got my fitting, you know, my fitting there that I was showing you. And then I'm starting my drip irrigation system. Now you can see I've come with a small piece, about six, six inches straight to a T. And then I'm taking this T so it's all the way around the system, the area that I want to irrigate with the drip tubing. And that is because it's what we call a looped system. And a loop system has more even distribution of the pressure than non-loop system. And so you can see eventually what we're going to do is put T's in everywhere to get all of our drip irrigation where we want it. We can loop it up to our sidewalk and driveway if we don't need the, the tubing closer together. If you buy 12 inch tubing where the emitters are every 12 inches, we usually think about putting the tubing 12 inches apart. And so you can see this is being installed for a ground cover bed. They've already put the ground cover plants in. They're just starting to grow. This is a parking lot island. This is an odd shaped bed over by Forest Hills Library. And so, you know, we had to twist and do and everything. And on this side, we did the point source because it was all shrubs and lantana and ornamental grasses. On this, on this side, oh wait, where did I do with it? On, on this side, we looped it and we did the, the, the drip line. And so we have two different stations, two different demonstrations on each side of the entrance to that library. And I thought that was a real good thing. So different patterns that makes it easy, easy, easy for you to do. You're not going to make it square. You're not without, without the um, elbows, you know, but you can most certainly gently loop it. And then, of course, once you get it down, we have these real nice pins that you can pin it down for. These will eventually rust away. And so every now and then you might have one pop up out of, out of control and you just get another pin and, and pin it back down. Now, um, I didn't like this bottom one. I, I, I have it in here to show you specifically because the landscape fabric it, it decreases the infiltration rate of the water going into the soil. So if you're going to put landscape fabric in for weed control, put the drip irrigation under it. And then attaching, you know, um, this, this guy wanted his herb garden way, way back there. And so what I had him do is I had him put a cap. This is a cap that can go right here. I can take this off and put this cap on and leave this so it's not going to spray water everywhere. And then he can put his drip irrigation in, not off of this, because the, the, the rate that he's going to water vegetable herb gardens can be very, very different than the rest of the landscaping. So when you put, when you, 
make it to an existing system, we're going to talk about that, you have to shut all of these off in order to do that. And so he laid the tubing down there, got the design just perfect. And then there's several different ways of attaching your garden hose to that. Bring in your garden hose from your spigot, you know, across a 50 feet of landscaping or turf grass in his case and, and, and attaching there. Here's another sample of attaching it to a faucet. And you can see I have it a nice big hose caddy that has about 200 feet of hoses. He ended up getting one like that too, so he could take it out there. Now converting an existing system, because I know a lot of people when they change the rules about narrow spaces surrounded by impervious um, surfaces, the city of Fort Worth, uh, and th this is a Tarrant County building right here, almost all their parking lot islands were then converted you know, to drip irrigation. And so this is something that you can do also if you would like. So one of the ways we can do this is we can replace a sprinkler head with a drip irrigation adapter. So this is the same size as your drip as your spray irrigation head would be. And so we could dig around this and we could then replace this drip irrigation head with this. Now what this is, is an adapter. And so I told you that you need a pressure regulator and a filter, and this is all built in. So if I undo this, you can see the pressure regulators right here and the filters right here. And what I've done, I put a T at the top, you know, so that I can start my loop right away. Now, of course, in a lawn area, this would be under the lawn so you could get the mower over it. You understand? And so what you have to do is think about how you want to do this. Um, then, you choose one head to put the adapter on or two, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then all the other ones, you would be taking the cap off and you can take the insides out too, do you see that? And then you would be putting this cap on. Now I know that um, a couple of places when we did the Forest Hill Library, um, the riser went too high and so we actually dug down and took the whole sprinkler off too. And we used um, a half inch cap right here because the riser was too high. That was in, it was in garden beds, not lawn area. And so the risers were too high. Okay, now let me go on to the next one. And so <clears throat> this is a, a another adapter type of adapter. You can see this is the, if I want to do it in the valve box, instead of using the adapter, this is what I would be doing. And if I wanted to do a micro irrigation system, this is what I would be doing. So converting the existing system, one or two head to be converted. Now, let me tell you why, because I run into this all the time. The front lawn area has a beautiful sidewalk down it. And it is in the same zone, same zone. Now, I don't want to be banging pipe under a sidewalk. And so what I would do is I would buy two of the adapters, converters, and I would put one on each side of the sidewalk and then put my uh, subsurface tubing under the lawn. I'll show you pictures of this being done so that you can see that it might be or might not be something you want to do, but same in the beds. And so on either side of the sidewalk, I had this beautiful foundation planting here with some beautiful um, perennial or, or, or annual beds in front of it, maybe ground cover. And again, it's on the same zone, on the same zone. And so again, I would buy two of the adapter converters and put it on either side of the sidewalk. So there's many ways, many reasons, you know, we might need two of those instead of one. Remember the spray nozzles that you have on, they're putting water out in gallons per, <laughs> not gallons, inches per, per minute, gallons per minute. 
And so sometimes, you know, we've got to cap these off. We can't have this running at the same time, the drip running, which is putting out water much, much slower, lower, lower pressure, and therefore it's, it's never gonna match, never gonna match. You wanna loop your outer edge of your drip irrigation tubing um, about six inches um, from where you want to do it. And so here's my valve box. Uh, this is just a sketch that you can draw yourself. Here's my, my valve box and here's my sprinkler head. And I've got sprinkler heads throughout this, this area. And so I should have, I guess, drawn them all in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use, <coughs> turn on the spray, water the regular runtime I would normally water, and then I'm gonna get out with a measuring tape. And <clears throat> I don't know if this is gonna be 25 feet wide or 10 feet wide, 15, whatever width and, and it went the width both ways, what area is being covered by your sprinkler system. You need those measurements in order to figure out how much tubing to buy and, and the fittings therefore too. I mean, we don't want it a seven trip to Home Depot. Right? <laughs> so then put it on paper. It doesn't have to be drawn to scale in any way at all, but you need some idea about what area you're gonna cover. And then what we're gonna think about is do we wanna do the 12 inch um, spacing? Is that what we wanna do? It's 12 inch emitters. And so here I have my adapter and I have a T on it and I'm gonna go all the way around that area that I measured that got wet by the sprinkler system. And then I'm gonna come in six inches, six inches. Cause I, 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 I can draw this picture here and you can see it's going to wet it both ways. It's not going to wet it one way at an edge, whereas a sprinkler system, if you put a half, you know, a half circle um, nozzle there, it would just go one way. And then what I'm going to do then is draw ever how many feet that I have here, whichever way I want to do it. And then I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You see what I'm saying? How many T's I need? If this was going to be square, I'd also want to see how many elbows I need. Because in some beds, instead of looping it, you might be um, needing the the elbows <clears throat> to square it off. Okay, this will give you an idea of how many to make. And then also um, what size package? I mean, you know, I have a pack, buy it in a big box with a thousand of these in it. And I don't think you want a thousand. So <laughs> give you an idea there too. You want to put those down about every three feet in order to hold it down. Um, eventually, like I say, they rust away. Sometimes they pop up and you need to put them down. Put it down before you put your mulch down. You can already have it planted or you can plant afterwards but definitely put your mulch down after you put their tubing in. And then you can see the wetting pattern. It's really, really good to, to do that before you put your mulch down so that you can be assured you have the wetting path. My husband is like, are you ever gonna run your drip irrigation system? And I'm going, what do you mean? I just finished running it. And he goes, well, well, I don't see it, you know? And the librarian at the Forest Hills Library said that same thing. And so you can get one of these. <laughs> this is so funny. When your drip irrigation tubing is on, this pops up like this. See the red head on it? There's also a brand that puts out a yellow head on it. So you can see that the pressure is up here pushing this up and your drip irrigation system is running. This is just a coupling that you can put a hole in your tubing and you can pop that in the hole so it will have the same pressure as what's going through the tubing. It's so funny when I have people ask me that question. But the wetting pattern is, is, is pretty important. Now, this of course is going in a ground cover bed, flower bed, shrub bed. Shrub beds are gonna be more linear than this. But in a lawn area, you can do the same thing and I'll show pictures in a minute how to do that. Okay, the adapters, different brands, of course, will have different adapters, but they're pretty much always the same. You know, you've got your 
adapter, your pressure regulator, and your filter in the tubing. Now, I will also say, in some cases, um, people um, put it already in the existing head, so they don't even have to dig a hole to put this on the riser where their where the regular sprinkler is. And so, um, I like I said, I always do a T on the adapters because you know I'm on a I want a loop pattern. And then there's this other adapter that you can use, you know, that can go on to the top of, this is just another one, but you still have to have this part right here, this part with the filter and the pressure regulator. You can see, see right here how that's coming out. And the only difference between this and, and what I've drawn right here is that I can start my tubing, but notice, I come right out, I come right out and put a T there so I can start my loop. So whether you want a T already on the head of your adapter or you just want one of these to start it, but you're still gonna wanna loop it. You're still gonna wanna loop it. And so this, if we're, we're gonna do it that way, oh man, I should have brought my wrench in here, but this goes right on as you can see in that picture this little riser right here that comes out of there. And so whichever way you do it, you still want to loop it is what I'm gonna stress. Now your porn source strip irrigation, of course, we mainly use the half inch tubing. There's larger tubing, three quarter inch. Oh gosh, there's inch, inch and a half, two inch. The farmers and ranchers will use those. But we have to remember that you're putting the drip in at the amount that you want the water to come out. In my rose garden, I have the roses six to 10 inches apart. I mean, feet, feet, six to 10 feet apart. And so if I'm only putting the drippers right there under the rose bush, that gives me a lot of leeway where I don't have any drippers between those roses, so nothing will grow. Gosh, if you believe that, I have a Brooklyn Bridge for sale. Weeds don't need a lot of water and they'll still grow, but still it's the idea. Many different types of emitters. Um, they're not color coded uh, universally and it's very, very difficult sometimes to hand someone an emitter and say, please go get me a 0.2 gallon an hour uh, dripper. And they look and see that it's red and they come back with a red dripper, but that brand's red dripper is, um, 10 gallons an hour. So, you know, it's just, <laughs> you need to, you need to read the label. You need to read the label. There is micro irrigation adapter that you can put on your riser coming out and you might have to extend that riser. And um, there's real nice extenders that you can purchase for your tubing. Um, you know, three inches, four inches, all the way up to six inches to, to do that. So look for those if you need to. They're called cutaways. You can cut away the amount that you want so that you're only um, putting it in the amount that, that, that you need to rise it up because these need to be above. They usually have six different uh, adapters uh, on, on the pressure regulator adapter and they have six places you can put tubing. You might not use them all, so they have a way to turn them off and turn them on if you're not using some of those. Here's one for an example out in the garden. Here's the type of emitters that you can put out. This is a 10 gallon an hour emitter or dripper. And um, you know, this is in an annual uh, flower bed. In this case, these are petunias growing here. This is a half circle one. That other one was a full circle one. And you can buy kits to help you get started. See, this is the converter right here. And then you could put the one to do the quarter inch. These are quarter inch um, holders that you put your quarter inch tubing. Here is the pressure regulator filter um, for a half inch system, all the different drippers that you would need in that tubing. And then you have Teflon tape. And you see this little thing here, I forgot to tell you about these. These are called goof plugs. And if you're going to use point source drip irrigation, you need to buy a package of, of goof plugs. Uh, this hole punch right here is different from the plier hole punch I showed you, but if you're gonna do a lot of that, like my 
60 foot long rose garden that goes around my perennial beds, you're going to want the, the plier type. type. If you go into plastic and then into a faucet, you always need to use Teflon type. You do not need to use Teflon type plastic to plastic, but um, you can. Okay, now to your faucet. You know, here's my faucet. Here's my um, backflow prevention device. I put a splitter on them. I like these big giant splitters. Um, I know they're uh, they're about ten to twelve dollars in the different locations. And you um, same thing with like a ball valve. If it's running parallel to the pipe, the water's coming out. If it's running perpendicular, you know it's off. And so then I have garden hose threading here. So I have a garden hose threading filter. I have a garden hose threaded faucet timer. This is a manual timer that you can get. And then I have a garden hose threaded pressure regulator and then the tubing adapter. And so that tubing adapter, you can buy the pipe threaded kind and start there. And if you're gonna do that, you're gonna need there's a little fitting uh, that you can get that has garden hose threading on one side and pipe threading on the other side in order to do this. It's available at any place that sells drip irrigation and plumbing supplies. Now, subsurface under a lawn, we've got to put it deep enough that the lawnmower is not going to suck it out. And so the manufacturer's recommendation is four inches. And so the difference, I've cut this away so that you can see it. Um, let's look at the emitter right here. It, you know, it's that plated system. I think I showed you a picture of it earlier. Oh, here's one. Here's one that's been cut open so that you can see it. See the emitters, the holes right there, this plated system. Okay, well, on this one, the difference is I've cut this away. It normally looks like this. Okay. I've cut this away so that you can see this itty bitty teeny bitty plate of, of copper there. Copper is toxic to plants. Can you all see that? It's toxic to plants. And so the roots won't grow into it. That's the difference between using drip line and subsurface, you know, under your lawn area. Now, of course, drip line goes perfect under your mulch. And so uh, your mulch will decompose and become part of the soil. And of course, you need to continually add that mulch. So when you think about trenching for drip line, you don't have to use a big ditch switch and dig these big, big, giant holes. You want a very, very narrow hole. You can see how narrow this, this um, you know what this reminds me of? I used to have an edger that was almost like a skill saw, but big, big, big big giant teeth on it, you know, that I'd run along the sidewalk and the, in the, you know, the roadway. Um, that's what this reminds me of, is one of those, you know, so it's pulling the soil out, it cuts it down four inches, and of course, then you put your drip irrigation tubing in. Again, you don't want to just hold it down with your soil, you want to use one of these pins, you know, staples, whatever you want to call them, to hold it in there. And you're going to use T's and elbows and um, maybe um, couplings, you know, to do it. You're putting your soil back in. And this is one, this is in the springtime. This is one week after installation. And uh, this is 90 days later. This was using Zoysia Palisade. Uh, what do you mean my battery's running low? I thought I had it plugged in. The, um, the um, Zoysia Palisade, very, very water conserving turf grass. This is done in the winter and the home didn't get a sprinkler system put in, so they're redoing it. They've dug out four inches of soil. They put it on the sidewalk right here. And then here's the roadway and they put the tubing in and you can see they've turned it on to see how many minutes it's gonna take it to water the whole area and then they're going to put the soil back down and hopefully they take all those stones out before they put the turf grass down and then they put the turf grass down not as drastic as the spring slides that i have for you but um, under new turf this is another thing you could think about is preparing all your soil lots and lots of compost you know tilled into the clay 
you know, maybe six inches, maybe four inches, you know, till that compost into there and then put your, your drip irrigation tubing out. You can see I've turned this on in order to make sure nothing's going to blow apart. That's the other advantage of that. And then over here, what I have is, you know, all the irrigators that came to take the class and we can see that it's all working very, very, very well. My valve box with all the filter and pressure regulators over here. Um, the trenchers, um, unfortunately, I don't see them being at the rental place at Home Depot and Sunspelt and all those different places you can rent equipment. This is what professionals will use, but um, professionals do have these smaller ones and the professionals sometimes uh, rent those to you. This is an end cap that you can put on. This is a crimper you can put on to help clean it out. This is a rainwater harvesting system set up just to irrigate this vegetable garden and it comes out with a little tiny transfer pump. There's a, a line across here with a gate valve at each line so you don't have to water um, the, the rows that aren't have anything planted in it. So those are sort of easy to put on in a vegetable garden. Faucet timers are manual. They'll turn the water off there at the timer, not at the spigot. You have to let it later go do that. This is again a manual one, but this is a, a battery powered one that you can put on your spigot. Many, many different brands of the battery powered one. Here's the whole thing like I showed you early, backfold prevention device, all your timer, your filter, your adapter for your tubing, everything's right there for you. Or you could put it on your, um, your irrigation um, controller that you already have. We recommend a soak and cycle irrigation system, even with drip irrigation that works really good where you do short cycles, you know, short run times. You can put your long run time in there and then ever how many cycles you want to do, it will do the division for you so you don't have to redo it every time. In order to figure out the runtime, you sort of do just like you do with your sprinkler system. I can put my tuna cans under there and watch it fill up with the dripper. Once you get your um, drip irrigation tubing in, whether you're going to do it from a faucet or whether you're going to do it to an existing system or a brand new system, one of the things you have to do is figure out your runtime. And of course, we want to make the math easy. You know, and so we figure the emitters, the manufacturer puts that in gallons per hour. And there's a mathematical formula that we could do that inches per hour, which is how precipitation rates are read. But one of the things we can do is turn it on. We can actually put a tuna can under that dripper and watch and time how it fills up or we can run it and then use a screwdriver and what the screwdriver is for is two things it can show you how deep the water has gone by the easiness of putting the screwdriver in the soil but then we also like if the tubing is right here we can go like this and then like this and then like this away from the little emitter hole and then we can actually tell how wide it is spread. In order to do that, you really need to let it run about 15 minutes and then wait about 30 minutes because of the way water infiltrates and percolates the soil. In clay soil, it spreads horizontally. Sandy soil, it goes down a little bit deeper, faster. And so we need, we need to understand that. And then once we've understand that, then we can figure do I need to run it for 30 minutes or 45 minutes? Remember, it's purposely putting out the water slow under low pressure in order to use and in, get the water into the soil. And so when we look at the wetting pattern, you can see right here where we have the dripper is right here, the emitters inside the tubing and it's dripping down right here. The one over here is the same way. Here's above ground shot of it spreading and how wide it spreads, how deep it spread is depending on its location in the manufacturer specification. And so if we're using subsurface or if we're using surface, 
So we've got to figure that out, whether we're using inline, like up here on the top row, or we're, whether we're using point source. And you can see on clay soil how much it spreads wide. And so it's very important that you, you know, figure out that runtime. Um, now, the other thing that we need to talk about, of course, is maintenance and repair. Part of the maintenance is maybe three or four months into the situation, whether you put your filter in your valve box, this is a filter and pressure regulator combination that can go in with your valve, or whether you have put in a converter at one of your sprinkler heads, we still have to think about checking out the filter and seeing if that needs to be cleaned out. Of course, if we're using city water, all it's going to be is a little bit of calcium crystals. You know, uh, that's it. That's it. But if you're using rainwater harvesting like I do, you got to check that a little bit more frequently. Of course, I'm filtering my rainwater before it goes into the drip line, but still it's good to, to check that filter. But repair. And so I have a tubing, a piece of tubing right here, and you can see where um, it has been, you know, like a little shovel's hit it, or uh, we see this at the school gardens all the time. And so um, I think I told you earlier, our repair is normally a coupling. A coupling is a piece of a fitting that puts two pieces of pipe together. And so usually there's enough give on um, our, our line that we can take our cutter and I can cut. Do you see how I'm doing that? Right, right, right there on the side of where that, that cut is. And I can cut that off. And then do you see right here? I can go right on the other side. I'm not going to cut a lot off. You see how little tiny bit that I did. And that little tiny bit is going to make it real easy for me to put this in. Now, there's two things about putting the pipe together. You know, it's not as easy as it looks. And so one of the things we have to think in terms of doing, of course, is getting it started. And you can see already, you know, it's not that easy. And so one thing I recommend is that we all use gloves, you know, with a uh, good padding on them to give you a good grip right here. And they can be rubber or they can be leather, you know, whatever garden gloves that, that you prefer. And that gives you a little bit more leeway of getting this in here. And we'd push and rock and push and rock. And you can see I've got it started here. Now, if I was squatting down in the garden, probably on my knees or, you know, um, I would then get the other one once I got that started a little. And then do you see me rocking and, well, can't do it on camera, can I? But rocking and pushing, see how I'm rocking and rocking and pushing and rocking and pushing, rocking and pushing, rocking and pushing. That's time consuming and difficult. And we want both of those barbs on it. Okay, the secret is this. This is a heat gun, like you might have on your thing where you sweat copper pipe together, or maybe you had to take some difficult wallpaper off, something like that. Hair dryer works pretty good too. And then I can turn this on and I could heat this up a little bit. It gets really, really, really easy. And boy, that just goes on like a knife through butter, soft butter, you know. And so you really want to eventually get it. You see that middle ridge right here. So when you have it together, it's going to look like this. And so you see in this school garden where I am, the kids have done a, oh, wait a minute. I didn't want to go that fast. Let me push it back. The kids have a lot of leaks. I've gotten some flags and I've marked where all those leaks are so we can turn the irrigation system off. And then here I am cutting. You see that little, little tiny nick in the pipe and I'm putting this coupling in here, right here, just like I started this one. I've got it, so just that little bridge and there's your um, fitting in there. Now, one of the things that we run into is sometimes the leak is right near the emitter. And so I can't get that fitting in where that emitter is. And so what I'm looking at here is I say, 
all my little pieces of pipe in, in a box. So I had lots of extra. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this new fitting so that I can replace that emitter that that cut is near. And then I'm gonna cut a nice, nice big piece out of there. And then I'm gonna use two of those couplings, one to put the pipe over here and one to put the pipe over here. You, usually you do four to six inches uh, in order to do that if it's 12 in the meters or 12 inches apart. And then, you know, it, it's, it's real easy to do and I'm not making, I'm not wanting to make it difficult but I just want you to know the helpful hint about wearing the gloves and maybe using a hair dryer or a heat gun to soften the pipe to make it go in easier. Now, purple denotes non-potable water. And, and someday cities all over are gonna require that everything that's non-potable go into a purple PVC pipe, purple drip line, purple boxes, purple pop-up heads. And you're gonna see that more and more. So I just wanted you to know that's available. Okay, maintenance, like I said, is this is opening the filter and, and cleaning out that. Disconnect it from a faucet if we're gonna have a hard freeze. And by a hard freeze, I don't mean 32 for two hours or 30 minutes. I mean, you know, like eight hours or something below, you know, 20, 25, something like that. We haven't had that in a long time, but I just want you to know. Um, not necessary to drain subsurface irrigation here in the Tarrant County area because we haven't had a freeze into the ground any depth at all in a long, long time. Okay, then also you have to follow all irrigation rules about your days to water, you know, using a timer, using a controller and a rain and freeze sensor. Uh, just, we had two inches, almost two inches of rain the other night, and I most certainly am relying on my rain and freeze sensor not to water the very next day after we have two inches of water. Well, that's true with spray nozzles, that's true with drip irrigation. So do that, we need to do that. And the other rules, follow all the irrigation best management practices like, you know, water only required. You know, all of these rules, maintain your system. You know, don't water so long you create runoff. You know, it's just, just rules like this that we need to understand. The other one that I'm going to stress because we're trying to save water, we're trying to water less, and that's maintain a two to four inch mulch layer in your flower, ground cover, garden bed, shrub areas. What that does is it increases the infiltration rate of rain and irrigation water, but it also slows down the evaporation of the water from the soil. And that's so, so important to keep even moisture in your soil. A lot of people ask about where they can get more information. I could not create some of the nice publications and some of the nice websites that the main manufacturers of drip irrigation have. So whether it's Netafim you're gonna buy or Dig or Rainbird or Toro, you know, go to these websites. They have pictures, they have drawings, they have how-to little videos about everything I've talked about today. So the help is right there. Show you how to draw a plan on paper, show you how exactly to go into a valve box if you wanna change the, you know, the pressure regulator and the filter in the valve box or show you how to use the converter. All of it's there. It's great, great, great help to refer to. Some of them have real nice booklets. I don't think you need to buy the booklets, but they have them digital so that you could download them onto your computer and then constantly refer back to those. And that's very helpful too. And all the parts are listed there. As far as more resources, your water utilities website is the best. Tarrant Regional Water District's website, of course, is one of the best. Save Tarrant Water, water is awesome. It'll get to all this conservation information. Texas Smartscape is a site that the North Central Texas Council of Government runs, and it's all about plants for water conservation. Lots and lots of pictures, tell you the height and the width and the color, and just many, many, many information you need if you're gonna change your landscape or 
start a new landscape with all these wonderful plants. Water University, which is where I used to work for Texas A&M, has wonderful websites about all the plants, about irrigation, about vegetable gardening, and they have pictures, pictures, pictures in, of, of the different plants that you can plant for water conservation. And they also have landscape templates, you know, so if I wanted to landscape this little corner over here, or I wanted to landscape, you know, my redo my foundation planning, they have plans for that, or my parkway, they have plans for that little templates, you know, that you would need to do that. And then of course, Tarrant County uh, Extension Office has a Master Gardener Help Desk, and this is a phone number, 817-884-1944. And please keep that number handy. The Master Gardeners are there Monday through Friday, 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And it's going to be so, so helpful for, for you to go there and ask them questions that we have an answer here or that you can't find on the web. Um, so please do that. Tarrant Regional Water District, Save Tarrant Water, offers the weekly um, watering advice, you sign up and they will send you an email whether you need to water or not water because we had two inches of rainfall the other day. Um, but, you know, we've had great, great advice for them. They spent the money to put weather stations all around Tarrant County in order to specify the different areas because I know sometimes it's very, very frustrating that it rains out here you know, and then it doesn't rain over there. And, you know, I got rain and she didn't get rain and it just can be very frustrating. And then don't forget the free irrigation checkup that you can order the, have, make an appointment for, have someone come out and help you. And then they have a green pro list. A green pro program is a program where landscape professionals and irrigation licensed irrigators have come to Tarrant County, Texas A&M Extension, of course, runs these programs for Tarrant Regional Water District, and they train the landscapers and the irrigators a little bit above and beyond specifically about water conservation. And so that's extra, extra special. And there's a list on their website of these people. This is my contact information now that I'm retired. I'm pretty much just an orchid grower, um, but I still work with a Tarrant Regional Water District, Texas A&M Extension, and of course, uh, Texas Master Gardeners. I hope that you've got a lot of these questions. Uh, I mean, a lot of your questions answered. If not, I'd like to answer those questions now. I think everyone put them on the, the virtual class with Heather. So Heather, you want to help me with those questions? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much, Thank Dottie. You. We did have a few questions um, towards the end of okay. our presentation. So um, let me pull those up real quick and I'll see what the audience has to say. Um, I know the first question was, um, if you know of any, do you know of any resources where people can plan and make these layouts. You know how you show the layout with all the yeah. trip and the lines and everything? Yeah. Do you know if yes. there's any like, computer yes. programs or? It, it, there are computer programs, um, but I think your best bet for those is go to the website of the manufacturer that does your drip line. And so these websites have those tutorials on them. And so everything I've showed here, they're going to show in more detail. And they're going to have diagrams of how to, for you to make your diagram. Of course, you're going to need, um, you know, a big long tape, you know, ever how long your zone and wide your zones are. But that's the main thing is, is put something on paper. It doesn't have to be drawn to scale, but just yeah. put it on paper to give you an idea about how much tubing you need, how many fittings you need. That's the best bet. But those tutorials on these websites really help. Okay, great. So for the for the amateur, it's probably best to just go ahead and draw, draw it by hand and you don't need any type of special okay. software or anything right. like that. Right? Start with one zone if you're doing a conversion. Start mm -hmm. with the easiest zone. Is that a ground cover bed or a shrub bed? Start easy, you mm -hmm. know, with one zone. And then if you see how easy it is to put it all together, if you, you know, see that now I want to do this other zone. So I've got my shrub bed, my foundation bed, my shrub bed over here, my fern garden over here. You know, I've got it over here, over here. Now I have not done the subsurface in my lawn and, and you know, I'll get to it someday. 
but you know, I've done all my best mm -hmm. and I am so pleased that I have done that. So start with something easy, start with something easy and then you'll see how easy it is. Or maybe not, maybe not. And then you might decide <laughs> to hire a licensed irrigator. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It matters how much you want to bite off on your own, right? Um, right. And kind of in, in the time, in the time that it involves. Right. Yeah. Time I don't think it's time consuming at all. You know, I use the gloves and I use the heat gun, you know, uh, to make it real easy to put the fittings together. So um, it's it's not, you know, what's more time consuming is doing all the measuring, and putting it on right. paper, making a supply list and one trip to Home Depot <laughs> instead of 10. Right. Probably That's do five or eight. Yeah. And kind of, yeah, and along those same lines, um, are there any websites or anything that you can recommend that has some have some of those supply lists or have kind of like a listing of all the different things that you've talked about today? Well, of course, the manufacturer's websites that I showed you here will right. have a list and picture and picture. That's very helpful of every single one that you want. But if you also go to whatever supply place you want to go to, whether that's Ewing or Metro Irrigation or Home Depot or One Site or Lowe's, you know, they will also have that. You go to the irrigation point of those big box stores and then you go to the drip irrigation part of the big box within the irrigation part and, and they'll do that too. But just going to the manufacturer's uh, website shows so much. It's really helpful. Okay, great. And just to be clear, all of these things can fit into each other. Like if I had a rainbird thing and like a Toro thing, they they can still go together or not not necessarily. And okay. and, I, and I'm going to tell you why I'm why I'm saying that because I've had people start with with one brand and then when they went back, they didn't really pay attention and. When you purchase the fittings, of course, these barbed parts right here is what holds the tubing together, you know, and if those are too small, even the little bit of pressure you use, a pressure regulator is here to lower that pressure, but even that can come apart, you know, and so it's very, very important that you, you have those right pieces. A lot of them are that way, you know, they're, they're universe, oh, I was going to find you this other part, but I didn't seem to have it right here. A lot of them will mix and match, um, but a lot of them do not. In my supply box that I take to community gardens and schools, I have a lot of these, you know, these half inch, you know, all thread rings that I can uh, put on there and tighten it down really, really good. And that's usually the case, maybe not where they had the wrong um, fitting and pipe, but maybe the pressure's a little tiny bit too high right there. And so that, that can happen too. Okay. Okay. So try try your best to stick with one brand if you can, basically, right? One brand. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's very affordable to buy extra fitting to have on hand, particularly, you know, the coupling, which would be your repair fitting. Right. Okay, great. Um, let's see, our next question is about those emitters, like when they say however many gallons per hour or whatever, how true is that? <laughs> and how long do you really water is, is what is being okay. asked. The, 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 the deal is with these is they're giving you an estimate at the pressure that they recommend. You know, so if it says 0.6 gallons an hour, you know, that's what at the pressure they recommend, which is usually 15 to 25 PSI. And so that's why all their pressure regulators, you know, all their pressure regulators are going to do that. They're going to reduce, because normally on a sprinkler head that's going to have a pop-up, it's 30 PSI coming up that riser. And so this reduces it down to the 15, 20 PSI that the manufacturer recommends. If you're going to do it in your valve box, the pressure regulator is in here. I, I know you can't see it, but the pressure regulator is right here. This is a small one, you know, compared to some of the larger ones. Might be able to get that in a valve box, but a lot of times you have to get a better, a, a larger 
valve box to do it there in the valve box. So whichever way you do, the hose fittings, same thing. I've got that pressure regulator for you to put on because 60 PSI is what is the recommended rate for coming out of a garden faucet. Okay. All right, so those should be correct as long as you've got the correct pressure going through it. Basically. Pressure, yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. It comes out very slowly. That's why I recommend you um, use the screwdriver method to see how deep it's gone and how wide it's spread or even put the tuna can, you know, put the tuna can under the dripper right here and run it, you know, for 15, just because the math is easy with 15, run it for 10 minutes. Yeah. Math is even easier, you know, mm -hmm. and, and see how much water is put out. And then you're going to the inches per hour when you do it that way. There's a mathematical formula to convert gallons um, per hour to inches per hour. Um, and you can find that on the web. You just ask, you know, the web, where is yeah. that conversion? And it'll be an interesting mathematical formula. To <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think I've looked that up several times on Google. Yeah. Okay, so, so when in doubt, if you're not sure about your pressure or whatever, then you just go ahead and test it. And then you can see for sure what's what's going on, right? And how many gallons per hour you're getting. Yeah, there, there's a way of putting a pressure gauge on your system, but of course you have to have the the threading, you know, to screw that down. And uh, I know when you buy the pressure gauge, it's interchangeable with one where you screw it with pipe padding or where you screw it with garden hose threading. And so I have both of those that I can put my pressure gauge on so I can do it at the spigot. And then if I want to, I could put a threading on my drip tubing and I could do that same thing, test to make sure it's working. I mean, okay. not that it's working, we know it'll work, right. but that it's the right pressure. The not correct too pressure. Low, but not too high. Right, okay. And, okay, so I have a question about, so I've got some drip lines and I've laid them out or whatever, and you can see whenever they're on top of the soil surface, right? So I can see, right. you know, how big the water What's comes out, right, right, yeah. But you Once can't see the depth. Right, but you can't see the depth, right. That's, that's where the so screwdriver comes. <laughs> should those kind of like drip circles meet each other like every time that I water? Yeah. That's okay. the ideal is you put your tubing close enough together that it's going to wet the whole area. Wet everywhere. And, you know, clay soil, you can put them six inches apart, you can put them 12 inches apart, you know, whatever you need to do. Now, most of us in our flower beds and garden beds, shrub beds that are keeping mulch there, always building up the organic matter, you know, it's 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 really, really nice to do that. But I'll give you an example. Um, one of the master gardeners wanted to put um, plants in front of like their community where they come into their neighborhood. And I said, sure, I'd be one to drip irrigation. And I called their city and, and told them about, and they thought, oh man, that's a great idea. We'll make it a demonstration. So anyone else who wants to do that could see the drip, drip irrigation. Well, the mistake they made, they didn't bring water to the area and they already planted it by the time I got there. And so they had knockout roses in the middle of this beautiful, beautiful little, I think it was uh, 25 by 10, and all these knockout roses. And then they had the native, not native, but beautiful ornamental grasses, you know, tall ones in the back of the roses and yeah. the short ones in the front of the roses. It looked really, really nice, but the water requirement for those ornamental grasses is much, 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 much less than it is for roses. Yeah, You know, and so I was just trying to think, you know, we've got to make this successful. You know, the city's gotten involved and they want to use it as a demonstration for other people in the city. And so what we literally did, we went ahead and brought a line in from the neighbors, you know, water that had agreed to um, use her water. And then when we made our loop around in order to put our uh, crosses to make our grid, what we did is we came in near the roses and then made another loop and then made another loop. Mm -hmm. And so therefore in the rose thing, 
we put the cross ones up six inches apart. But in where the grasses were, we did the standard 12 inches apart. And three years later, I just happened to be in that city and just happened to drive by there. And it still looked good. Now, this is before Rose Rosette came and killed all mm -hmm. the knockout roses, or the, didn't kill them, but, you know, got everything was really bad for a while. Yeah. Um, they've changed those roses out now into other roses that they think might be knockout, you know, Rose Rosette resistant. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if there is such a thing. <laughs> my rose yeah. garden, out of my, I guess, 30 roses, I lost 15 of them. So I was very wow. upset, very upset. Yeah, half. I mean, and that's not even that bad. I've heard of plenty of people who've just lost everything. Yeah, didn't lose any ornamental grasses. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, those, they're hardy, well, right? Lantana, you know, so there are <laughs> things that bloom all summer long, like lantana and Turk's cap and, Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, all my, I think I have like 20 different salvias in my landscape, you know, <laughs> that bloom all summer long. Well, you yeah. know, it's just, you, you just have to study the plants real carefully. Nothing beats a rose. Nothing beats a rose. But there are <laughs> some pretty other ones out there. There are some beautiful natives out there, definitely. Okay, well, it looks like we just have one more question. Um, okay. Someone is asking about their... Um, Sandy loam soil. Um, they've got soaker hoses moved around to irrigate fescue and trees. Um, what is your opinion on that? It says that they've got lots of water loss um, and they want to, I guess, install a drip. But if you already have, it says 30 plus year old pond trees. Um, is that so? I guess, is that possible to even install something after you already have that? Or what is your advice on yeah. that? Yeah. Well, the thing about hose in sprinklers, whether you use the kind that go back and forth or round and round, hose in sprinklers don't have much control about the amount of water that they're putting out. But you can use tuna cans. You can use tuna cans to measure that amount of water, just like you can any. And then you can put a faucet sprinkler, you know, faucet timer on your sprinkler. You can figure it out. You know, so there's not much. And the other thing is, since they do put water out so fast, you start with clay soil. As it gets wet, it sort of swells up. That's why the cycle and soak irrigation schedule works so well. It sort of swells up, no more water comes in. But if you run that for 30 minutes and then turn it off and then run it for 30 minutes an hour later, you're gonna get more water into the soil. The thing about the trees, you know, in an orchard situation, of course, that's their money, you know, that they're putting out there. And so when you when you think about that, you've got to realize, I was going to turn off sharing my screen. Okay, um, yeah, okay. Still... I can share mine instead. There we go. And so, um, you know, when you're talking about the contraries, they need about an inch of water, you know, weekly, and that's, you know, if we don't get rain, you need to put it out with irrigation. But the thing is, towards the end of the season, like right now, you know, they're going from, the pecans are going from their water stage to the nut stage. And so the they're, they're on the tree, but if you crack one open now, they're not the nut you want, you know, and they're in what we call water stage. And so they need lots of water to hold those nuts in the tree. And so I get a lot of calls every year, a lot of emails every year. What's, why are my pecans falling? And a little bit of that has to do with a little creature called squirrels. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with the amount of water we can put down. Now, in a homeowner situation where you're using the pecan trees more for shade than as a crop, mm -hmm. you know, it's not so essential. But if you want, to give us all a bag of pecans for Christmas or Thanksgiving, I'd be glad to take them. You know, no, I'm choosing. <laughs> you know, but you see what I'm saying? Um, so the same thing. The other thing about pecans, they're uh, uh, every other year crop for the homeowner. They'll produce lots and lots and lots of pecans one year and then not as much the other year. And so I don't want people to worry that I'm not irrigating enough because I don't have pecans this year, whereas I had a ton last year. That's right. just the, 
the nature of the beast. In an orchard situation, they go in with a big pruning saw and prune half the row this year and half the row the next year, every other side. And so they're getting crops every year because pruning stimulates growth and you know, they get right. the cons every year by managing that better, just right. like grapevines are cut back every year in the wintertime. So the new growth is what produces grapes and they have a control situation there. But yeah, irrigation is good. Now putting in a drip irrigation is, you know, uh, circles around the tree, not close to the trunk, but out away and, and whether it takes three circles or four circles that you want to do, that, that's an easy breezy thing to do using tees, using tees to make your circle yeah. and bringing in your line to do that. But the problem is mowing under those trees then. And so if you could put your circles around your pecan tree with your drip tubing and put that under mulch, so hopefully you don't have to mow there. If you do use a string trimmer instead of a mower, but the line that goes from this pecan tree over to this pecan tree, that needs mowing probably. And you need to make a small trench and pin that down about mm -hmm. four inches deep. Make that a line, not a drip line. You know, you can get them without the holes on it to yeah. go from tree to tree. Okay. And then that can be hooked to a faucet or right there where those trees are. You could put a faucet, a, a garden hose attachment. Mm -hmm. I think I showed a picture of that back um, in another slide and bring your garden hose out to that area and attach it. Of course, if you're going to do that, you need a faucet timer. So you don't forget about it and <laughs> leave it running too long. And again, yeah. use the screwdriver to check on the depth. Okay. Great, wonderful. All right. Well, I think that is all of our um, questions that we have today. So thank you very much, Dottie, for, for giving us all the information about drip irrigation. And now we can all go and install our own drip irrigation, hopefully, <laughs> in our houses. Um, I do want to talk about this. Uh, Dottie did talk about some of our um, some of those programs. So um, again, you can find those at SaveTarrantWater.com. Um, the Free sprinkler evaluation for Tarrant County residents that Dottie was talking about, that weekly watering advice, all of that you can find on SaveTarrantWater.com. And then if you want to know about um, upcoming events just like this one, you can join our mailing list there at SaveTarrantWater.com and get our um, newsletters, or you could just look at our event calendar and see more things coming up here. Um, and I believe in about a month, we have another um, drip irrigation class going on that is going to be a DIY drip irrigation, again with Dottie. So if you want more information about drip irrigation, um, take a look at our website and then you can see in about a month from now we'll be doing another kind of similar drip thing. So thank you so much, Dottie, for all of your time and all of your wisdom. And thank, thank you everyone you. for tuning in and we'll see you for the next one.